the topic tonight to me is one that's extremely challenging. And it has to do with the subject. The picture you see there is one I took at a metal worker shop in Ontario, Canada. That crucifixion scene was hammered out of metal. And tonight we're looking at a portrait of Christ's love. And the fact of what it means, what it looks like. And so the question I have as I was thinking about this is, you know, the word love is used freely today. We see it on signs all over the place. We see it in advertisements. It describes many things. But the question is, what is love? Do we know what love is? Is what we see people doing in the name of love, love? How do we know? And tonight, hopefully, we can have a better understanding of what love looks like. But I have a question for you. The opposite of love is what? What would you put in the blank? Anyone? Selfishness. Selfishness. Hate. Hate. Selfishness is the opposite of love. It's exact opposite. We tend to think of hate. And in, in degrees, hate is. But when you look at what love is and its action, you realize that selfishness is its exact opposite. So tonight, perhaps we'll see how selfish we tend to be and how much we have to change and grow in love. But as we think of marriage, marriage is a total commitment and a total sharing of the total person with another person until death. Uh, what do you hear? What, what is Stuart Scott or Wayne Mack trying to get across here? Marriage is a total commitment and a total sharing of the total person with another person until death. What can you hold back in marriage? Nothing. It's total commitment. Briefly, let's consider the definition of the word portrait. First is a pictorial representation of a person usually showing the face. Second, a graphic portrayal in words. And tonight we'll see that love encompasses both definitions. And let's begin with our model, Christ in the church. That was Vaughn and I almost 29 years ago. In case you didn't know, my hair wasn't always gray. But 28 years ago, we were married. And our model is Christ and the church. And so what I want us to think about and what I hope to impress on you is that every time you look at your wedding picture, you see something. In the husband, the representation, or he is called to represent Jesus Christ in this relationship. For the wife, she is called to represent the church. And John 3.16 is a verse we all know well. I'm going to read it in the New King James. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. A portrait of Christ's love. Your marriage is to be that portrait. 
When you look at your wedding photo, try to remember that. Let's begin with the portrait of Christ's love. And in part, I have a little story here I want to read. It is unanimously considered the most horrible form of death. Among the Romans, the degradation of, was also a part of the infliction, and the punishment, if applied to free men, was only used in the case of the vilest criminals. The one to be crucified was stripped naked of all his clothes, and then stretched along the crossbeams, and at the center of the open palms, the point of a huge iron nail was placed, the, which by the blow of a mallet was driven home into the wood, then through either, fo either foot separately, or possibly through both together, as they were placed one over the other, another huge nail tore its way through the quivering flesh. Whether the sufferer was also bound to the cross, we do not know, but to prevent the hands and feet being torn away by the weight of the body, which could not rest on upon nothing but four great wounds, there was, about the center of the cross, a wooden projection, strong enough to support, at least in part, a human body, which soon became a weight of agony. Then the accursed tree, with its living human burden, was slowly heaved up, and the end fixed firmly in a hole in the ground. The feet were but a little raised above the earth. The victim was in full reach of every hand that might choose to strike. A death by crucifixion seemed to include all the pain that and death that death can have of the horrible and the ghastly. This dizziness, cramp, thirst, starvation, sleeplessness, traumatic fever, tetanus, publicity, publicity of shame, Long continuance of torment, horror of anticipation, mortification of untended wounds, all intensified just up to the point at which they can be endured at all, but all stopping just short of the point which would give the sufferer the relief of unconsciousness. The unnatural position made every movement painful. The lacerated veins and crushed tendons throbbed with incessant anguish. The wounds, inflamed by exposure, get gradually gangrened. The arteries, especially of the head and stomach, became swollen, and oppressed with surcharged blood, and while each variety of misery went on gradually increasing, there was added to them the intolerable pang of a burning, raging thirst. The heart, the heart enlarged by the tremendous stress, many times would rupture. Thus, he literally, literally died of a broken heart, a ruptured heart, and hence the flowing of blood and water from the wound made by the soldier's spear. Such was the death to which Christ was doomed. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. I don't know what you think, but I know that for me, as a representative of Christ within my marriage, I, I don't get there. I miss it. That's what he did in the name of love for you and I. Genesis chapter 2, and I'm just going to pull verse 24 out. And this is in the New Living Translation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united in one. Now I know many, we do not think of this in the context of, of Christ and his church. But as I've considered it, I believe there's a distinct parallel there. First and foremost, Christ left his home in glory. He left a place where he was revered, honored. He was God. He left it to come to a world, to come to where his bride lived. To redeem her. He came to a people who did not love him. Who rejected him. He left his home in glory. Secondly, I believe that he clings to us. Now, I'm going to expand this as to what I mean. He left his home in glory. He came to earth. He pursues us. And scripture clearly says that he will never leave us nor forsake us, Hebrews 13, 5. 
His goal is to take us to where He now is, that we can be with Him forever. Something to think about. I know this is a paradox. God never lets go of us, but He will let us go. What I mean by that is, as we pursue Christ, He will not let go of us. But if we choose to turn our back on Him, He will let us go. But even within that, He is always pursuing us. He is always striving to bring us back to Himself. Lastly, he, His desire is that we are united in Him in love. He loved us first when we were unlovable. He died in our place and broke down the barriers that kept us apart from Him from our Father. John 17, 21, and the prayer there, he does express that we may be one in them, in God, in him. His desire is to unite us with God, with himself. And how does the bride respond to this? I have a story here. And I don't speak Korean, so I'll try to not butcher the name too bad. But Ani Su was a Korean woman who lived through terrible times during the Japanese occupation of Korea in the 30s through 1945. She took a powerful stand alone for God's truth despite arrest, imprisonment, and possible execution. She was imprisoned in a prison camp for her faith and refused to bow down to Japanese idol worship, though many Christians did on that one particular day. She was tortured for six years until her release. Throughout her life, there were countless examples of God's intervention. On the day of her release, a sympathetic prison guard shouted, Ladies and gentlemen, these are the ones who for six long years refused to worship the Japanese gods. They fought against severe torture, hunger, and cold, and have won without bowing their heads to the idols of Japan. Today, they are champions of the faith. The crowd then shouted, praise the name of Jesus, and began to sing joyously. The bride's response to her husband is, she loves him. And we see that in scripture where we are called to love God. We are called to love him. The scene of heaven will be one of continuous praise and worship. Secondly, she submits to him and tries to please him. You know, for Ani, she was committed and she did what she knew God wanted her to do. She refused to worship anyone but him. She defended him, even when those who were opposed to him reviled him, opposed him. It didn't matter what the cost was, she obeyed. She was submitted to her husband, Jesus Christ. Lastly, the bride's response means that she, will, she honors, values, and respects him. You know, Peter tells us that we are to be ready to give a response in the, for the gospel. She speaks well of him to anyone who will listen. How excited are you about Christ and what he's done for you? Do you speak about him? Is it a pleasure? Do you remember what he did for you? She remembers what he has done for her. She remembers the sacrifices he has made. And she recognizes her unworthiness of it. Lastly, for this first question becomes, what does this mean? His love is the standard by which our marriage relationships are measured. He sets the example of what true love, submission, and respect looks like. His love works to free you from your self-centeredness. It enables you 
to more freely love others without the need of reciprocation. And lastly, marriages only thrive when we love our spouse like Christ loved us. Let me say it again. Marriages only thrive when we love our spouse like Christ loved us. Each of us are commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And the second commandment is, like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor and thyself. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. That condenses the entire gospel. Moving into the portrait, our marriage. In other words, there is a portrait. There is a picture. We've seen it in Christ's life on earth. And now, today, our marriage is to be the portrait that reflects Christ to the world. The story is told about Leonardo da Vinci and his painting of the Last Supper. And I know there's a number of stories out there. I'm not sure exactly which ones are accurate, but I picked this one because I like it, and I think it fits well with the emphasis of the text. At the time he painted The Last Supper, he had an enemy who was a fellow painter. Da Vinci had a bitter argument with this man and despised him. When he painted the face of Judas Iscariot at the table with Jesus, he used the face of his enemy so that it would be present for ages as the man who betrayed, betrayed Christ. He took delight while painting this picture and knowing that others would actually notice the face of his enemy on Judas. As he worked on the faces of the other disciples, he often tried to paint the face of Christ, but couldn't make any process. Da Vinci felt frustrated and confused. In time, he realized that was wrong. what was wrong. His hatred for the other painter was holding him back from finishing the face of Jesus. Only after making peace with his fellow painter and repainting the face of Judas was he able to paint the face of Christ and complete his masterpiece. Our marriage is a portrait. The canvas of this portrait is God's purpose. And his purpose is to develop the unity and oneness that resembles the relationship between Christ and his church. This unnatural marital unity will magnify his redemptive power and glorify his name. Note, I say unnatural marital unity is a love for each other that harmonizes and crosses differences Natural. Not to follow one man. It is not natural. Naturally, I don't know about you. I know who I love, and it's not my wife. It's not the Lord. It's myself. Let's consider the paint. And the question, what is love? Stuart Scott says it this way, a selfless and enduring commitment of the will to care about and benefit another person by righteous, truthful, and compassionate thoughts, words, and actions. A selfless and enduring commitment of the will. Love is a choice to care about and benefit another person by righteous, truthful, and compassionate thoughts, words, and actions. It's a whole person response to another. And we will detail it a little more later, but are all called to love? Is everyone called to love? Yes. Yes. Do we come loving? Yes. We don't come loving God, but we come loving something. It's ourselves. 
Love is not optional. We love. The only option or choice we have is as to who or what is loved. Love is, first and foremost, an act of submission. Each person has to submit themselves to God in order to love as God commands us to love. It is a choice. It is a choice to submit to what God commands to love Him and then love others. It is first and foremost an act of submission. Secondly, love is the action of self-denial. Take me to a scripture in the Bible that describes self-denial, that defines what self-denial is. Is there any text that details what self-denial is? First Corinthians 13. And self-denial is never mentioned. Self-denial is the action of love. It denies what I want, my personal comfort, my dreams, and my goals in deference to what is loved. When you look at 1 Corinthians 13, the action of love is always away from the person who is loving. Christ left his home in glory and came to the earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Love also provides what is needed for something to thrive, and it's not myself. The object of what is loved is what it focuses on and works at enabling to survive. And also, love values what it loves or what is loved. If you love your wife, you will value her highly. And that value is going to flesh out in a lot of ways. But first, love is not acquired by loving myself. I know different texts say that we're commanded to love others as we love ourselves. That is not a command to love ourselves. It's simply saying that's how we're to love others. We love ourselves too much. Our biggest problem is we love ourselves. That's what selfishness is. It's self-love. Our culture emphasizes the importance of self-esteem, but in reality it's important for us to recognize that self-esteem is anti-scriptural and anti-love. When you consider carefully what self-esteem emphasizes, its focus is myself and my view of myself and my importance. Self-esteem, as developed currently in culture, is anti-scriptural, is anti-love. That's a topic in itself. Love is not a romantic feeling or physical attraction. When a young fellow sees a girl and he goes, wow, he says he fell in love. That's not love. Not as the Bible describes it. Love's more than that. That may be a part of it, but love is far more than that. It's more than just a romantic feeling or a physical attraction. Love is not sex. Sex may be part of a loving marriage, but it cannot be equated with love. See, that's what the world's infatuated with. And that's what the world calls love. Love is more than that. Love is not about reciprocation. Even though love may appear reciprocal in a godly relationship... A careful study of scripture shows the action of love is always away from the one who is loving. 1 Corinthians 13, if you study it carefully, it's always about what is loved. It's not puffed up. It doesn't think about itself. It thinks about others. 
scripture, scripture clearly shows that self-denial is a byproduct of loving others as God commands us to. In other words, Scripture emphasizes love. Love your brother. Love. But the reality is, that's positive. But the reality is, love is incredibly painful. It hurts. Because it means I focus on you, not myself. It means I do what you enjoy, what you want, not what I want. That's self-denial. But the emphasis is love. I don't know how many of you have prayed for God to help you love your spouse. I know I have. Did you suddenly love her or him? You must demonstrate love in order to build love. If you don't practice loving, you will not love. If you do not practically love and look for ways to love your spouse, you will not grow in your love for your spouse. Love is action. And that action produces love within me. And it develops love. The brush. As you notice, we're painting a portrait, are we not? We have the canvas. That is what the painting is painted on, and that's God's purpose. We have the paint, which I believe here, according to an emphasis, especially within Ephesians chapter 5, is love. And emphasizes love. Ephesians chapter 5. Just pulling a couple of verses out here. Verse 22. For wives, this means to submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 24. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave his life for her. And skipping down over. To verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. Verse 33, so again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. There is a fatal marital misconception that I want to briefly address and that is this leaders before lovers and I'm speaking in particular to each of us as men Ephesians establishes headship it doesn't directly mention leadership yet if you study it its emphasis is leadership our emphasis tends to be on the husband's authority and the wife's submission. Now, I'm not saying that is wrong, but what I'm saying is this. If we begin with leadership, we're going to run into problems. Leadership is different than headship. Headship is not leadership. Headship is a position or a role in an authority structure. Leadership is how one uses that authority. And Paul mentions headship. But the, the, the emphasis of Ephesians chapter 5, especially to the men in particular, one is, I was, will say this, is he's drawing the parallel between Christ and the church and the marital relationship. But he's emphasizing the husband's need to lead and how he is to lead. What we have to remember is, the truth is, godly lovers make godly leaders. Everything of the gospel, of the law, hinges on love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. And, the, the whole thing of what we recognize within this is mu you must first be 
a godly lover in order to be a godly leader. And a godly lover loves the Lord. And from that, he loves his wife. Paul's emphasis is not on headship. It's on leading, loving. Actively and sacrificially loving your wife is true godly leadership. And trust me, many times it doesn't feel like leadership. Dear, you want to... Could we go out for supper tonight? Um, okay. Where do you want to go? McDonald's. I, I hate McDonald's. I've said this before. Okay, in other words, if I love my wife, I'll ask her what she wants to do. I may give suggestions. But what do I decide? What's the basis on which I decide what I do? upon what she enjoys what she wants I like buffets she doesn't do you get what I'm saying Paul says here is headship but his emphasis is on leadership and in particular we're to lead in love godly lovers make godly leaders but it hurts it comes with a price i have to lay down my desires my will what i want and do what god wants secondly he initiates he leaves you know it really struck me recently in this study when i as i read genesis 2 and I went through every place this is mentioned, and it's what it says. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united in one. Who does the leaving in this text? In every text where this is mentioned, who does the leaving? The husband. He leaves his father and mother. She doesn't need to act, think, or cook like your mother. Also, you're not her father. She can do things differently. You know, as husbands, we're to leave our home and meet her. The life that was before, you leave it. One thing in our home was, prior to our marriage, was when I lived at home, was my dad was an avid fisherman, too much of a fisherman. Everywhere we went, we went fishing. It didn't matter whether it was Florida, it didn't matter what it was, we went fishing. And fishing is all you did. So guess what happened when, a number of years ago, we went to Florida. We didn't go fishing. We did everything but, because different times we would take, when I worked with my dad in the furniture business, we would take furniture to Florida, and guess what we would do? Fish. Now I enjoy fishing. But you see, you have to leave. He leaves the life that was before. He develops what works for them as a couple. May require a change in hobbies at times. May require a change in occupation. You see, when he leaves, his father and mother... He also leaves behind the freedoms of a single life. Each one does. He has less options available to him. You leave yourself, your desires, your dreams, what you want to be, and try to formulate it to what also she wants. You cling. There's no other options. When you say you do, you have closed all options of anything different. She is your wife. You are committed to her. There are no, there's no allowance for her. Let me see, who would I marry if she would die? No. You have left your father and mother, and you are to cling to her. That means complete and total commitment. It means your focus is her. 
You love her. You die for her. She is what you're committed to. And we see here, he loves. Wayne Max says this, when it comes to being the lover God wants us to be, most of us never reach first base. That's kind of blunt, but it's true. I know it is for me. I love myself too much. You love her in spite of her sins. 1 Peter 4.8 speaks of love covering a multitude of sins. It covers those peculiarities that irk you. You love her in spite of her differences. You love her by allowing her to fulfill her role and responsibility. And, and there's places where a husband also submits to his wife. Have you ever thought about when your wife makes a meal, who decides what meal she makes? Who's supposed to just be quiet and eat? Now we're not talking mutual submission. I'm not talking that. But what I'm recognizing or saying is when a role is given to a wife, you allow her to operate within that role. And there's areas where you defer to her. She decides what to cook for supper. You zip it and eat. No complaining allowed. I, I'm serious. I'm not joking. If you give her, she's your wife. Groceries are her choice what to purchase. You may agree on a budget and you give her the freedom to purchase whatever she wishes to purchase within that budget. You love her by talking to her, by listening. James says that we're be, to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And I believe God gave us two ears for a reason and only one mouth. Perhaps that tells us what he emphasizes, listening. Listening with your mouth shut and your eyes on her. You love her by sacrificing for her. You love her by protecting her, by treating her respectfully. That's protecting her. By not requiring her to do things she is unable to do. You protect her sexuality by not asking her to dress immodestly or by keeping inappropriate pictures of her. I, I'm going to be honest with you. If a husband has inappropriate pictures of his wife on his phone, I call that pornography. Pornography is not defined by who the picture is of. Pornography is defined by what the picture is. And just because it's a picture of a spouse does not mean it's not pornography if it's inappropriate. You don't keep inappropriate pictures about someone because you love them so much. It's always a perverted twist to it. You love her by helping her with chores and responsibilities. You love her by not comparing her to anyone or anything. It's extremely cruel for a husband to say to a wife, you know, my mom does it this way. Now, if she asks is one thing. You know, I just wish she would cook this soup like my mom does. That's not loving her. If she asked, well, how can I do it? Well, then advice can be given. But I cringe when I hear a husband saying, you know what? My mom makes it this way. I wish she would make it that way. That's extremely hurtful. You love her by treating her like she is something special. By opening the door for her by being affectionate, by praising her, especially in front of the children and others. You love her by being 100% committed to her, by having eyes for no other, and thinking only of her. Her response, wives, remember, your primary ministry in life is your husband, not your children. She responds, by choosing submission. Bill Gothard states, Submission is the freedom to be creative under divinely appointed authority. Too often, 
and, and this is not Bill Gothard, this is more myself, too often we preach submission to the wife and never give a thought about what we are asking her to submit to. You know, I, I often hear, well, she's not submission, and my question always is, to what? And the reason I ask that question is because the husband is commanded to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, she is to be submitting to a husband who is dead to himself. Christ died. He laid it all down. He held nothing back. And he controlled every part of those last hours of his life. Scripture numerous times says now Jesus, recognizing that all things were given into his hands. Everything about Christ's crucifixion was orchestrated by himself. Submission is her responsibility, not the husband's. She recognizes his authority over her and submits willingly to him. There are wrong views of submission. There's no such thing. There, there's an argument to, for total submission. And what that means is no matter what, a wife must submit. Scripture does not teach total submission. Submission does not mean she is inferior to her husband. She is equal to him in personhood, but submissive to him and rule. She is not her husband's slave. She has input in the home. All of this happens within and under the umbrella of her husband's authority, but she is not just a figure to set on the shelf. She is actively involved in the function and operation of the home. Secondly, she chooses to respect him. You see, there is a com it's a command. There are no escapes. It is more than just obedience. Respect is the action of love and submission. You cannot separate love and respect. If she loves her husband, she will respect him. If she doesn't love him, you're going to find it's difficult to respect him. Respect is an attitude. It's how she thinks about him. Another thing within respect is the, the thing of respecting has to do with his position. It is God-given. The command to respect is not performance-based. It isn't related to his worthiness. Just like your husband isn't responsible, responsible for your submission. Now it is far easier for a wife to respect a husband who is loving her as Christ loved the church. And so the command is distinct to her, respect your husband. The command to the husband is distinct, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And I believe when we look back at Genesis chapter 3, we will see particular reasons for that. And Genesis 3 would imply that one of the things that happened with the fall is that when it states her desire will be for her husband, there is some debate on it, but the general thought is that it relates to perhaps more so also of a battle for control within the home. That is the product of sin. The husband's focus is on conquering the earth. And so, within that, in a fallen world, many times a husband will not be worthy of a wife's respect. But we see the, that command is not based upon performance. It is a command to respect. First and foremost, the position. Respect grows in its fullness when the person is respect-worthy. Ways a wife can respect her husband is by not comparing him to other men. I just said to the husband, don't compare your wife to other women or to your mother. Don't compare them to other men. 
You know, my dad would never do that. Or Jill's husband does this for her. I wish she would do that. That usually kind of goes down like a rock in the water. It doesn't sit well. It's not respecting him. He's not your dad. He never will be Jill's husband either. He's yours. You respect him by protecting him. If a child is upset with you or dad, what does, mom, what does mom do? She acknowledges, it's important to acknowledge how dad sinned and help the child to forgive. Refuse to commiserate with them. Focus on their words and actions and point them to Christ in the sense of their need for him and how they themselves have sinned in this situation. Two things happen. I'm sorry, I got a little mixed up there. Didn't keep it going like I was planning. But two things happen when a mother takes sides. One is she will struggle to respect her husband. And second, the children will lose respect for her and her husband. They will respect neither of them. Be careful about, in respecting a husband, be careful about contradicting him in public or in front of the children. Also, about correcting him in public. When a husband needs corrected, it is important to correct him in private. The same for a husband in correcting something with a wife. Don't do it publicly. Last point that we have here in her response is with affection. Titus 2, chapter, or Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Actually, I'll just pull out verse 4. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. A quote here that I thought is interesting is, the grass is always greener where you water it. And this quote was given within the context of a topic that is was titled Respectfully His. Tell him, tell your husband you love him and, and show him you love him by doing special things for him. You know, within this, we don't realize, a wife doesn't realize how much her affection can motivate her husband. Now, he can't use that as an excuse if she doesn't show it. But it can motivate him to act, but it also protects him. She protects her husband by showing respect for him with expressions of affection, words of encouragement and praise, both in public and private. Tonight, what Ben did, he didn't know I had this in here, but he was doing that very thing of showing respect, showing love for one another. Practice cultivating a heart of gratitude for the sacrifices he regularly makes for you. Have you ever taken the time to ask yourself this question? Why has he worked so hard for many years? Why has your husband worked hard all these years that you've been married? Anybody want to answer that? Could be multiple answers. Supporting and providing for himself, right? <laughs> for his wife and family, right? He works hard to make sure that you have enough food to eat, that you have what you need to fill your role. Think about that. Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why has he worked so hard for so, for so many years? If he were single, would he have to work so hard? Only if he trips a lot, but then he wouldn't be working as hard. So, you know, your thankfulness and affection enables a godly husband to better resist the temptations he must daily face as he provides for you. A lack of affection increases his vulnerability to those temptations that he faces on a daily basis. Last point. The painter is you. Each one of you. If you don't like the painting, you must look at the painter. If you look at your marriage and you say, you know, 
I don't even know what this picture looks like. It's not what it should be. Where do you start? You start with the painter, you, yourself. Remember, what is the opposite of love? selfishness. If love is the paint that makes the picture, that gives the picture its beauty, and your picture is marred and ugly, is it ugly because you've loved as Christ loved? Or is it ugly because you loved yourself? You were selfish. If you don't like the painting, you have to start with the painter. You have to begin with yourself and say, you know what? This painter's got the, a problem. It's not the wife's responsibility to make the husband love her. She can't make him love her. God commands him to choose to love her. Neither is it the husband's responsibility to make his wife submit to him. That's her job. He cannot make her submit. Each is commanded to fulfill the responsibilities that God has given them. In closing, if your marriage is the only picture the world could see, that reveals the relationship of Christ and his bride, the church, what would they see? Does it glorify or shame? Does it glorify or shame his holy name? I missed a word in there. Again, I want to leave you with this challenge. If your marriage is the only picture the world could see that reveals the relationship of Christ and his bride, what would they see? Because you see, your marriage is the portrait that reveals to the world Christ's love for his bride, the church, and her respect for him. God bless.